It now gives me a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Fabio Papa. Uh, Dr. Papa graduated from the University of Sao Paulo at the Ribeiro Preto School of Medicine, where he also completed residency. He then pursued a clinical fellowship in cardiovascular anesthesia at the University of Toronto. He obtained a master's in health practitioner in clinical education at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He is a fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography. Throughout his career, Dr. Papa has been actively involved in teaching and education in perioperative transesophageal echocardiography and point of care ultrasound, also recently joining us in Victoria for our annual anesthesia conference there. He has been both locally and internationally involved in curriculum development. He's currently a staff anesthesiologist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, where he holds the position of assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And he's also the cardiovascular anesthesia fellowship director at St. Michael's Hospital. Fabio, thank you very much for joining us. We're really looking forward to your lecture and I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Amari. Thank you for the kind um, introduction. Thank you for you and Marcos for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's not the first year, and but it's always a pleasure to be participating in this conference. So, hi everyone. The topic of my presentation is image misinterpretation. So I have no disclosures, and over the next twenty minutes or so, by no means, um, I'll go over a um, comprehensive evaluation and discussion about um, imaging artifacts. But I'm going to review some of the most common imaging artifacts that we encounter in our clinical practice, discussing ways to help to avoid or at least identify um, imaging uh, misinterpretations. The last part of the presentation, I'm going to use some examples that we encounter in our daily practice uh, in order to try to differentiate true pathologies from misinterpretations. What is an um, imaging artifact? I, I like this uh, definition. It's simple. It's a display phenomena that do not properly represent the image structures. And there are four different classifications of imaging artifacts. So uh, the structures, they appear to be there when in fact they are not. One example, one example that I like to mention every time I, I think about this is reverberations in the ascending aorta. Uh, sometimes mimicking a type A dissection. The second type, type is when the structures are not there. Uh, they, they do not appear to be there when in fact they are. I think this one is easy to exemplify uh, thinking about um, shadowing caused by the mitral valve when you cannot see the LV properly. Sometimes the structures can look differently from reality and I'm gonna when I think about this, I think about blurring and blooming artifact in the mitral valve and on 3G looking from the left atrium, which I'm going to um, describe a little bit um, later in the presentation. And also any structures that appear to be in the wrong location, especially now when you do a lot of um, structural heart procedures with um, plaster devices and, um, and uh, devices also in the left atrial appendage. Normally, the imaging artifacts, they are normally the occurs for two different reasons. The most common is related to how the ultrasound wave when traveling from one um, um, from one structure to the other, how the ultrasound wave um, behaves in terms of reflection or refraction. And it's also um, another source of um, imaging artifacts is how um, is related to the ultrasound beam properties. We can also we cannot uh, forget also the presence of cardiac devices that can also cause artifacts, and also we cannot forget the presence of artifacts not only in two G, but also in the three G modality. Two, spe two special considerations we need to we need to make when thinking about um, imaging artifacts. The, the first one is how the ultrasound wave travels uh, between two different tissues. For example, we have the ultrasound probe. The ultrasound probe emits uh, the first the, the ultrasound wave. The ultrasound wave travels through the tissue one, which has um, a different um, acoustic impedance from the tissue number two. When the ultrasound wave hits the boundary between these two tissues, what happens with the ultrasound wave are twofold. The ultrasound wave can be reflected most of the time with the same angle of, um, of um, um, the same angle that was um, uh, used for the, for the income wave. 
or the ultrasound wave can be refracted um, most of the time with different angle because the, the two tissues, they have different acoustic impedances. The other thing that is important to mention is that like from the moment that the ultrasound wave is uh, emitted by the ultrasound probe and to the moment they eat, the, the ultrasound probe receives the ultrasound wave, the ultrasound wave is pretty much um, blind to what happens to the ultrasound wave between these two moments. And in order to create a proper imaging, the whole software, the ultrasound wave needs to, to, to make some assumptions in order to process and create a proper um, image from the from the from the structure so normally the ultrasound wave has four creates four different assumptions first of all the ultrasound wave propagates in a straight line the second one that the structure is going to be imaged just once um, the third one is the just the, the, the structures in the path of the beam are going to be are going to be imaged and are going to be generating the the reflection and also that the position of the structure is prop, uh, is proportional to the travel time. Every time one of these um, assumptions are violated, uh, we have the creation of one artifact. Probably the most common artifact that we see on, a, on our daily practice is the reverberation artifact. The way I like to think is that like uh, the ultrasound wave gets like um, trapped back and forth between two different uh, strong reflections. As we can see on this example here, we have the ultrasound wave from the transducer. It's emitted and then hits the a strong reflector, bounces back to the transducer that in most of the time can be can act uh, uh, can act as a, um, a strong reflector, bounces back to the first reflex and keep doing this ping pong uh, thing. Um, and because the ultrasound wave thinks that distance is proportional to the time of reflection, it pretty much creates the image, the image structure like uh, with double the distance from the original reflection, reflector. As you can see on this image, you can see um, probably the strong reflector on this image is the interface between the ascending aorta and the pulmonary artery. And you can see there is a the, the, there is a reverberation artifact uh, created, which is double the distance from the original reflector. This one is easy to identify. We all know that probably this is an artifact. Also, one thing uh, that helps us to identify and to be sure that it, this is an artifact is that the reflected um, artifact moves uh, with a much higher amplitude than the original structure. This one is easy to identify, but this one, which is the same artifact, not, not so much. This patient came for a came from home from, uh, for an outside uh, for an um, outside echo for a follow up from for another disease, and it was seen on the descending aorta, um, this kind of structure that could be related to a um, type A dissection. Of course, the patient, the clinical context, the patient had nothing, was not, a, was not symptomatic. And as you can see, one tip to identify that this is an, like, um, an artifact is that with color, um, the reverberation doesn't change anything in terms of the color flow. There are other ways of the reverberation that the names are different. For example, we have the comet tail artifact. Normally, we see in the descending aorta, it's caused by uh, is, um, small uh, arterosclerotic, arterosclerotic plaques. They're very close one to each other. And then you have this bounce back and forth from the reflector, uh, reflected wave that gives um, origin to this comet tail artifact. Another reverberation artifact with a different name is the ring down artifact that sometimes we see when you have like um, residual bubbles, especially on the left atrium. And it's caused by trapping of these small, these small spaces with fluid that are surrounded by um, residual air. It causes what is called um, Comet um, ring down artifact. We can also see the same type of uh, artifacts reverberation in 3G. The mechanism is, is pretty much the same. And sometimes we deal with these artifacts on our uh, on our daily practice. As you can see here, we have the bicable view with a uh, with a venous cannula, and it's hard to identify at first which one is the true 
um, cannula and which one is the artifact or caused by reverberation. Of course, the reverberation artifact always going to be in a um, um, in terms of depth, is, is going to be a little bit um, deeper than um, than the original structure. But we can see that sometimes, especially at the beginning, uh, when you see these images, it's important to differentiate between one or the other. The other type of um, artifact that you normally see is acoustic shadowing. This one is, is, is much easier to understand. Here is, we have the usual example of a mechanical mitral valve, but you can also see acoustic shadow, shadowing caused by um, atherosclerotic um, calcium in the papillary muscles. Also in 3G, the same way, we have this huge plaque in the aortic root and also the same thing with the, with the, the semi-thoracic aorta. Another type of uh, artifact that we, we don't see very often is much more common when you're doing transthoracic echo is refraction, is when you have the creation of, um, of um, um, the creation of the same, uh, of the same uh, image twice, as you can see on this mitral valve leaflet, looks like you have a duplication of the mitral valve is caused by this type of artifact. And, and lastly, in terms of wave reflection and refraction, we have the mirror, mirror imaging artifact, which we also see most of the time we are imaging the descent to Rasca Orta. One thing that is important to mention is that every time we have a mirror imaging artifact, color flow and post wave Doppler and continuous wave Doppler, they are also mirror uh, imaging like the, like the original image. Another type of artifacts, they are created by uh, ultrasound beam properties. The most common example is the side lobe artifacts. What we what usually happens, we have the main lobe, the, the main beam, and then we have a small beams with a uh, lot less energy um, laterally to the main beam. So sometimes these lateral um, beams with less energy, they heat a very strong, a strong reflector, and then this wave is reflected back to the transducer. One of the assumptions is that, that everything is reflected to the ultrasound beam, is interpreted by, interpreted by the ultrasound by the ultrasound system as coming from the main beam. So the image that is laterally um, um, disposed is now is image at the center of the screen. We can see this example here of the descending thoracic aorta. We see the guide wire in the descending thoracic aorta, and you can see this radio imaging. Um, in the far field, which is kind of uh, the side lobe of this image. Another example in the ascending thoracic aorta, the mechanism is the same. And this one is a true dissection, but you can see the arc caused by some uh, side lobe artifacts. It's important to differentiate for a true dissection. Of course, the presence of cardiac devices and also what happens in the OR is another source of um, imaging artifacts. As you can see, this electrocautery image here, easy to make the diagnosis. And of course, we have artifacts in 3G. The most common and the most uh, easiest one to identify is these teaching artifacts when you're using like a multi bit acquisition. But we also have other artifacts that sometimes we don't um, pay too much attention. When you see the suture line, for example, of this mitral ring, um, much thicker than it, it really is. It's called blurring. It's caused by the difference between resolution in the three different planes, the axial, uh, sorry, the axial lateral and elevation resolution. This difference um, makes the, the stitching artifact, the stitches of the mitral uh, ring uh, much thicker than they really are. And blooming is exactly the same mechanism, but happens with mechanical, uh, metallical structures. We also have, we also have um, uh, another artifact in 3G, where you can see the orchic valve um, in short axis view, looks like there is a hole at the center of the, of the orchic valve, especially in diastole. This is a dropout artifact that is easily um, recognize, recognize using the 2G image, which offers you a much um, much better axial and lateral resolution. Most of the artifacts are easy to identify. Most of the time they have no clear attachment. They are not reproducible in different views, which that's why it's important to always look um, 
one image that you don't know what you are looking at in different views, and most of and they are not affected by color Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, or continuous wave Doppler. How to avoid most of the artifacts? Change the angle of incidence, change the view, change the uh, ultrasound settings. Most of the time, you'll be able to 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 avoid these traps. Imaging pitfalls, they include not only artifacts, but they also include misinterpretation of a properly represented structure, whether normal or pathologic. You, you know, I'm pretty sure about all these pitfalls. We have the station valve, we have the Chiari network, which is sometimes easy to, um, to misrepresent as um, vegetation on the right side. We also have um, um, crystal terminalis. We have lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum. All of these um, pitch valves, I'm sure we all know how to identify. We also have the moderator band on the right ventricle. And we also have the Coumadin ridge between the pulmonary vein and also the left atrial appendage. We have the trabeculations also of the left atrial appendage. Okay. So for the last part of my presentation, I'm going to present a few cases here. They are related to some artifacts. They are some of them are related to some uh, to some pitfalls. But it's important that the reason why I brought these uh, examples is because first of all, I, we found we we found them on our clinical practice, and it can also happen with you. And we can we need always have to we need always to have a high index of suspicion in order to try to avoid these traps. This is the first case. This patient came in the morning. He had um, tissue, um, a tissue mitral valve in the morning. He was in the ICU. Um, overnight, he became unstable. He had a TE done. And as you can see, the LV, of course, doesn't look good. But if you look, the right ventricle looks like he has a collection on the right ventricle, um, perhaps um, pressing the right ventricle, uh, impeding its um, diastolic um, it's diastolic feeling. So um, it was made the diagnosis of tamponades. OR was called, the surgeon was called, the patient was about to go to the OR, but then reviewing the morning images, we can see the images already there since the first image. You can see a normal biventricular function, and you can see this here, like to me, a, a very big pericardial fat on the right ventricle coming off bypass. The structure was also there. Even on 3G, it was possible to see there was, uh, th that it was a pericardial fat. So um, OR was canceled. The patient was treated um, clinically, and he improved overnight and uh, then next morning. Case number two, as you can see, the patient came with an acute aortic syndrome. The patient has a, a pretty big intramural hematoma, as you can see. Also, you can see on the descending thoracic aorta, very close to the arch. Um, there is a dissection, as we all can see. But what was really uh, interesting at the start of the case, it, it, it was difficult to acquire proper images of the left ventricle in, and even from the right ventricle. There are something um, coming in and out of our field. It was really difficult to see anything else. Looking the, uh, turning the probe to the left, what we saw at the left uh, um, chest was this um, huge amount of fluid. Um, we told the surgeon, but then look closely, we noticed we cannot see the descending thoracic aorta. So we made a diagnosis of gastric fluid. We put an MG, we drained almost 1.5 liters of fluid, and then the image got much better, much better. We were able to finish our examination. This is a patient that came for a redo um, sternotomy. He had a tissue, a tissue arch valve done a few years um, back, and he came for a severe arch insufficiency the valve need, need, need to be replaced. But the, on the pre-op echo, nothing was mentioned about MR. We saw this image, the surgeon saw this image, we were kind of like starting the case and he asked us to quantify this, how bad was this MR. But if you look closely, and I'm gonna show you the image without color, you can see the MR, it happens when the mitral valve is still open. So it was made the diagnosis of uh, diastolic MR, which is kind of described um, happening in cases of severe aortic regurgitation. This is the uh, frame 
that I took um, both images and you can see the MR happens and the mitral valve is too open. So nothing was made with the mitral valve. Patient went on bypass, had a tissue valve, um, arch valve replacement and he did well. So left atrial appendage, always uh, important to make the diagnosis of um, low flow causing um, smoke or even causing like um, creating some thrombus. This is easy to make the diagnosis, but what happens if you have a patient coming for a cardioversion, you do a TE to rule out um, uh, left, atrial left atrial appendage thrombus, thrombus and you see this image. Would you cancel the case, send patient home for a few more weeks of um, anticoagulants to bring him back for another echo and then shock? It's better if you stop, you do a comprehensive examination. In, in this case, we saw that this image on the left was actually um, pectinal muscles from the left atrial appendage. So we, had, we, we finished the echo, patient had the cardioversion and went home on the same day. Left atrial appendage thrombus, this is most of the time straightforward to make the diagnosis. You can see the left atrial appendage thrombus where it's supposed to be. This is the same patient, Why on bypass, we had the dislodged thrombus. Uh, we, told the, we told the surgeon he opened the left atrial and removed the left atrial, um, the, the thrombus. But what we do when you have a case like this, patient came to come to the ward for another procedure, um, bypass almost finishing, we are kind of starting to come off bypass and you see this image. Patient had no factors for thrombus, looks like it's attached to the left atrial uh, wall. What do you make of, of this? So we'd go by, would you go back on bypass and uh, open the left atrium to see what it is? So this is very unusual to see, but it's possible to happen. This is an invagination of the left atrial appendage. We came off bypass, the heart was full again, and the, the left atrial appendage went back to its original place. My last case, this patient had a, a tricuspid uh, replacement um, a few years back due to um, endocarditis. He left the hospital and um, he lost follow-up for 18 months. He came back to our service this time. Um, he had a transthoracic echo done somewhere else and it was seen he had um, severe tricuspid stenosis. He came for a redo sternotomy and tricuspid valve um, uh, replacement. This is our first image. You can see there is something on the tricuspid valve without color disease to see, with color disease to see, you can see the flow acceleration. Looking closely and with more detail, looks like there is something on top of the tricuspid valve. Kind of hard to see what it is. So um, this was done like uh, quite a few years ago. So we did a, like a um, 3G zoom of the tricuspid valve. And you can see, of course, there is some stitching artifacts, but there is something on top of the, the tricuspid valve, kind of preventing it from opening and closing properly. We went on bypass, and the reason of this patient uh, tricuspid regurgitation is that the holder of the tricuspid valve was still there. The patient had a tricuspid valve um, replacement, and he did fine uh, coming off bypass. So my take home messages are every time you see something that is suspicious, that you think that is something that was not supposed to be there, first of all, stop and think. Correlate with the clinical findings, correlate with the patient patient um, clinical history. If you're still not like 100% um, sure what is happening, try to acquire and try to interpret the imaging using multiple views in different modalities. It is essential for the for the final information while doing the uh, the TE. And I try to use those cases just to exemplify situations in, in which one error could have led to different uh, surgical results. And with that, I'll finish my presentation. Thank you again for watching. Thank you, Mari.